Section 5 of Three Years in Europe, or Places I Have Seen and People I Have Met. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Three Years in Europe, or Places I Have Seen and People I Have Met, by William Wells Brown. Letter 5. Monsieur de Tocqueville's Grand Soiree. Madame de Tocqueville. Visit of the Peace Delegates to Versailles. The Breakfast. Speech-making. The Trianons. Waterworks. saint Cloud, The Fate. Versailles, August 24. The day after the close of the Congress, the delegates and their friends were invited to a soiree by Monsieur de Tocqueville, Minister for Foreign Affairs, to take place on the next evening, Saturday. And, as my colored face and curly hair did not prevent my getting an invitation, I was present with the rest of my peace brethren. Had I been in America, where color is considered a crime, I would not have been seen at such a gathering, unless as a servant. In company with several delegates, we left the Bedford Hotel for the mansion of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and on arriving we found a file of soldiers drawn up before the gate. This did not seem much like peace, however it was merely done in honor of the company. We entered the building through massive doors and resigned ourselves into the hands of good-looking waiters in white wigs and after our names were duly announced were passed from room to room till i was presented to madame de tocqueville who was standing near the center of the large drawing-room with a bouquet in her hand i was about passing on when the gentleman who introduced me intimated that i was an american slave at the announcement of this fact the distinguished lady extended her hand and gave me a cordial welcome at the same time saying, I hope you feel yourself free in Paris. Having accepted an invitation to a seat by the lady's side, who seated herself on a sofa, I was soon what I most dislike, the observed of all observers. I recognized among many of my own countrymen, who were gazing at me, the American consul Mr. Walsh. My position did not improve his looks. The company present on this occasion were variously estimated at from 1,000 to 1,500. Among these were the ambassadors from the different countries represented at the French metropolis and many of the elite of Paris. One could not but be interested with the difference in dress, looks, and manners of this assemblage of strangers whose language was as different as their general appearance. Delight seemed to beam in every countenance, as the living stream floated from one room to another. The house and gardens were illuminated in the most gorgeous manner. Red, yellow, blue, green, and many other colored lamps, suspended from the branches of the trees in the gardens, gave life and animation to the whole scene out of doors. The soiree passed off satisfactorily to all parties, and by twelve o'clock I was again at my hotel. Through the politeness of the government, the members of the Congress have not only had the pleasure of seeing all the public works free and without special ticket, but the palaces of Versailles and saint Cloud, together with their splendid grounds, have been thrown open and the waterworks set to playing in both places. This mark of respect for the peace movement is commendable in the French, and were I not such a strenuous friend of free speech, this act would cause me to overlook the padlocks that the government put upon our lips in the Congress. Two long trains left Paris at nine o'clock for Versailles, and at each of the stations the company were loudly cheered by the people who had assembled to see them pass. At Versailles we found thousands at the station, who gave us a most enthusiastic welcome. We were blessed with a goodly number of the fair sex, 
who always give life and vigor to such scenes. The train had scarcely stopped, ere the great throng were wending their ways in different directions, some to the cafés, to get what an early start prevented their getting before leaving Paris, and others to see the soldiers who were on review. But most bent their steps towards the great palace. At eleven o'clock we were summoned to the déjeuner, which had been prepared by the English delegates in honor of their American friends. About six hundred sat down at the tables. Breakfast being ended, Mr. Cobden was called to the chair, and several speeches were made. Many who had not an opportunity to speak at the Congress thought this a good chance, and the written addresses which had been studied during the passage from America, with the hope that they would immortalize their authors before the great Congress, were produced at the breakfast table. But speech-making was not the order of the day. Too many thundering addresses had been delivered in the Salle des Saint-Cécile to allow the company to sit and hear dryly written and worse delivered speeches in the tennis court. There was no limited time given to the speakers, yet no one had been on his feet five minutes before the cry was heard from all parts of the house, Time! Time! One American was hissed down, another took his seat with a red face, and a third opened his bundle of paper, looked around at the audience, made a bow, and took his seat amid great applause. Yet some speeches were made, and to good effect, the best of which was by Elihu Burrett, who was followed by the Rev. James Freeman Clark. I regretted very much that the latter did not deliver his address before the Congress, for he is a man of no inconsiderable talent, and an acknowledged friend of the slave. The cry of, The waterworks are playing! The water is on! broke up the meeting without even a vote of thanks to the chairman, and the whole party were soon reveling among the fountains and statues of Louis the Fourteenth. Description would fail to give a just idea of the grandeur and beauty of this splendid place. I do not think that anything can surpass the fountain of Neptune, which stands near the Grand Trianon. One may easily get lost in wandering through the grounds of Versailles, but he will always be in sight of some lifelike statue. These monuments, erected to gratify the fancy of a licentious king, make their appearance at every turn. Two lions, the one overturning a wild boar, the other a wolf, both the production of Filan, pointed out to us the fountain of Diana. But I will not attempt to describe to you any of the very beautiful sculptured gods and goddesses here. With a single friend, I paid a visit to the two Trianons. The larger was, we were told, just as King Louis-Philippe left it. One room was splendidly fitted up for the reception of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, who, it appeared, had promised a visit to the French court. But the French monarch ran away from his throne before the time arrived. The Grand Trianon is not larger than many noblemen's seats that may be seen in a day's ride through any part of the British Empire. The building has only a ground floor, but its proportions are very elegant. We next paid our respects to the little Trianon. This appears to be the most republican of any of the French palaces. I inspected this little palace with much interest not more for its beauty than because of its having been the favorite residence of that purest of princesses, best of queens, and most affectionate of mothers, Marie Antoinette. The grounds and building may be said to be only a palace in miniature, and this makes it still a more lovely spot. The building consists of a square pavilion two stories high, and separated entirely from the accessory buildings, which are on the left, and among them a pretty chapel. But a wish to be with the multitude who were roving among the fountains cut short my visit to the Trianons. The day was very fine, and the whole party seemed to enjoy it. It was said that there were more than one hundred thousand persons at Versailles during the day. The company appeared to lose themselves with the pleasure of walking among the trees, flower-beds, fountains and statues. 
I met more than one wife seeking a lost husband, and vice versa. Many persons were separated from their friends, and did not meet them again till at the hotels in Paris. In the train returning to Paris, an old gentleman, who was seated near me, said, I would rest contented if I thought I should ever see my wife again. At four o'clock we were en route to saint Cloud, the much-loved and favorite residence of the Emperor Napoleon. It seemed that all Paris had come out to saint Cloud to see how the English and Americans would enjoy the playing of the waterworks. Many kings and rulers of the French have made saint Cloud their residence, but none have impressed their images so indelibly upon it as Napoleon. It was here he was first elevated to power, and here Josephine spent her most happy hours. The apartments where Napoleon was married to Marie-Louise, the private rooms of Josephine and Marie Antoinette, were all in turn shown to us. While standing on the balcony looking at Paris, one cannot wonder that the emperor should have selected this place as his residence, for a more lovely spot cannot be found than saint Cloud. The palace is on the side of a hill, two leagues from Paris, and so situated that it looks down upon the French capital. Standing as we did, viewing Paris from saint Cloud, and the setting sun reflecting upon the domes, spires, and towers of the city of fashion, made us feel that this was the place from which the monarch should watch his subjects. From the hour of arrival at saint Cloud till near eight o'clock, we were either inspecting the splendid palace, or roaming the grounds and gardens, whose beautiful walks and sweet flowers made it appear a very paradise on earth. At eight o'clock the waterworks were put in motion, and the variegated lamps with their many devices displaying flowers, stars, and wheels, all with a brilliancy that can scarcely be described, seemed to throw everything in the shade we had seen at Versailles. At nine o'clock the train was announced, and after a good deal of jamming and pushing about, we were again on the way to Paris. End of Letter 5 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista.